Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today for our State of Third-Party Risk Management 2024 webinar. My name is Jesse Redman, and I will be your host. On your screen, you should see multiple widgets that you can use, including Ask Question, Media Player, Slides, Related Content, Speaker Bio, Request Demo, and Help. If you are unfamiliar with our webinars, all the widget boxes are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to maximize your screen space. At the bottom of your screen in the toolbar are icon buttons you can use to show and hide the widgets. You can expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner of the widget. If you experience any issues or have technical questions, you can use the help widget or submit them along with any other questions through the Ask Question widget. Don't worry, we do capture all questions throughout the session. We will be answering some during the webcast, but those that we do not have a chance to answer live, we will address with you via email. Today's live session is eligible for one CPE credit. If you wish to receive this credit, please remember to be logged in individually with your own credentials, answer all three of the polling questions that appear on your screen, be in attendance for the entire live one hour session, and complete the follow-up survey. We will be sending the link to that follow-up survey 24 hours after this live session concludes. You, if you meet all requirements, we will send your CPE certificate within five to seven business days following survey submission. With us today, we have Hillary Jewhurst, Venminder's Head of Third-Party Risk Education and Advocacy. She will be walking you through the results of our annual State of Third-Party Risk Management Survey. We'll explore important insights and findings of the survey and discuss the changes, challenges, and best practices for third-party risk management that are recommended for 2024. Our white paper covering the results is hot off the press, and we're very excited to provide a copy to everyone here on the webinar today as it covers the results in depth. To grab your copy, go to the Related Content widget, and you'll see the link named State of Third-Party Risk Management 2024 White Paper. You will also see a link to, to today's slide deck, a link to our website, a link to our samples library, links to our vendor cybersecurity checklist, our framework for a successful third-party risk management program ebook, our how to get organizational buy-in and commitment for third-party risk management ebook, as well as a link to our library of additional resources in the related content widget. With all that being said, I would like to hand it over to Hillary. Hillary, the floor is yours. Well, hello everyone and welcome. So we are gonna get started today to just talk about the survey in general before we jump right into those survey results. And then of course, at the end of the session, we're gonna wrap up with some best practices and some Q&A. So let's jump right in. So this is our eighth annual survey, and it's really exciting because we were able to look at such a broad variety of industries, uh, organizational sizes, and assets. Um, we looked at everything from financial services to retail to food services, insurance, healthcare, you name it. And we do look at the survey as a really great way to kind of get that deep look at practices, challenges, why we're doing it, and third-party risk management benefits. All right, so as we go through all the information today, we are going to cover a lot of different points, but I want to give you some highlights right up front, and you can look for these as we go through the presentation. The first one is, is the third-party risk management programs. We know they've always been small, but they may be getting smaller. And the majority of organizations do believe there's ROI in third-party risk management. Unsurprisingly, cybersecurity is still a top priority concern, but artificial intelligence is coming up hot on its heels as an emerging risk for third-party risk management programs. Organizations are still feeling a lot of pressure from regulators to improve their third-party risk management, and we're seeing an increased use of risk intelligent tools to monitor third, fourth, and nth parties. Okay, so let's jump into the actual survey results. Well, we all know that third-party risk management programs can vary a lot depending on the organization's unique outsourcing approach. But regardless of the size, organizations have to understand who they're doing business with and the products and service, 
provided. They also need to understand the risk and criticality of those third parties. And so comprehensive and current third party inventories are a must. But the survey indicates that organizations are paying attention because only 4% of our respondents this year were unsure of just how many third parties they had, which is down from 11% last year. Now, the number of organizations with small, mid-sized, and large programs remains relatively stable. But those with very large programs increased by 5%, which could be due in part to new regulatory requirements. So the interagency guidance on third-party relationships, which came out last July, clarified that third-party relationships are really any business arrangement, excluding those with your customers, which for a lot of organizations meant putting more relationships under the third-party risk management program. Another major component in third-party risk management in terms of size and scope of the program is how many vendors are considered critical. Now, keep in mind when we use the term critical, we're using this as a label to identify that very small subset of vendors that are truly essential to your operations. To ensure we give enough attention to critical third-party relationships, we should also consider the entire organization, not just what is critical to a business unit or a project. As a general rule of thumb, no more than 15% of your total vendor inventory should be considered as critical. Now this year, the majority of organizations were well within that threshold and considered 15% or less of their total third-party population to be critical. For the 13% that reported more than 15%, we encourage taking a second look just to uh, reaffirm that the criteria used to identify critical is correct and to ensure that the third parties are accurately identified. And the reason for this is, is that third party relationships require the most attention and management. And they're going to be the first ones that auditors and examiners ask about. So if we have too many critical vendors, we could unintentionally dilute the focus we need to put on them and consume extra time and resources to manage them. So for the 6% that are unsure, just keep in mind that it is essential to identify which of your third parties are actually critical to your operations. Not only is this the best practice, but for regulated industries, it is a firm requirement. So where a third-party risk management program sits within the organization can greatly affect its success. Now, we always recommend that it's aligned where it can maximize its effectiveness as a risk management discipline. A lot of times that looks like reporting into enterprise risk management or compliance. And in our survey, nearly half of the participants reported to risk departments or compliance departments. But you can implement third-party risk management different ways, and 19% of teams report to IT and InfoSec departments, and others have aligned it with finance, sourcing, procurement, legal. This just really emphasizes that there's a lot of flexibility for third-party risk management programs, and there's different options for organizations to select what works best based on their specific structure and requirements. But regardless of the department where third-party risk management reports to, it is essential to ensure strategic placement within the organization to make sure that third-party risk management receives maximum visibility, authority, autonomy, sponsorship, and support. So we've talked about reporting structures, but the operating model really tells you how that third-party risk management work gets done. So when it comes to operating models, there's basically three to choose from. There's centralized, hybrid, or decentralized. So over half of the companies that responded use a centralized model. And this is where all third-party risk management activities are handed by a dedicated team. This approach can be really efficient and consistent, but may result in vendor owners within the line of business being less engaged in identifying and managing risk. And sometimes this model can create confusion for vendors who wonder ultimately who they need to answer to. Hybrid models are really growing in popularity, and this model allows for a dedicated third-party risk management team to maintain the framework, structure, and flow of the program while 
Other stakeholders, usually vendor owners within the line of business, are actually responsible for managing vendor risk. Only 10% of companies use a decentralized approach. And this can be for a lot of reasons. A lot of organizations, when they start off, don't have dedicated teams or even clearly defined goals. So the work is spread out across multiple people, multiple departments. Now, the problem with decentralized models is they can lead to inconsistent risk management, you know, poor documentation, sort of like who's on first mentality. What is important to understand is that most companies are handling their third-party risk management internally, and only 1% outsource. Ultimately, the choice of model depends on your company's needs and goals. But regardless of the model, maintaining an internal purview and accountability for third-party risk management is crucial. So we do know that a lot of third-party risk management teams may not be as effective as they could be because they're not getting the right level of cooperation and support from the internal business units and vendor owners. So according to our survey, the majority of third-party risk management teams are still encountering a lot of challenges getting enough support. 73% found it challenging but manageable, while 15% found it extremely challenging. So for the 12% of teams that don't have any issues, it's really important to understand that achieving and maintaining those desired attitudes and behaviors around third-party risk management, that's really directly influenced by the overall tone from the top. And that is because the actions and words of senior leadership directly affect the organization's overall success in managing third-party risk. But it's not just the top of the house. All levels of management need to prioritize third-party risk management through regular communications, actions, and their own behaviors. So one recommended action is to ask for KPIs related to third-party risk management to be incorporated into the performance reviews or vendor owners, so they can be held accountable. Now, while you're thinking about that tactic, it's time for our first poll. Jesse? And this brings us to the first poll question of the day. You should see the poll question now in the slides area. If you have any issues, please feel free to send us a message using the Ask Question widget, and we will be happy to assist. As a reminder, if you wish to receive the CPE credit for today's session, you must answer all poll questions and be in attendance for the entire live session. This poll question is, how do you plan to utilize the results of the 2024 survey? Third-party risk management program benchmarking, identify areas of improvement for our third-party risk management program, learn more about best practices, one or more of the above, other or you're not sure. Hillary, we have some time now to answer a question from the audience. All right. And this question is, we only have 32 vendors. Do we even need a third-party risk management program? Yeah. Well, uh, you're lucky. Uh, 32 is not a terribly large amount of vendors that need to be managed. But yes, uh, you do need a program. And the reason for that is, is that even though it's not a huge number of vendors, it's highly likely that those vendors can still impact your organization, whether that's through cybersecurity breaches or regulatory violations. So it is important to have a program. Um, with that few vendors, you may not need a dedicated person to do it. You may just need someone to do it part-time. But I would definitely recommend uh, getting started, identifying who those critical vendors are, and go about risk assessing them so you can understand where you have to do due diligence and monitoring. I hope that helps. Thanks everyone for answering that poll question. Here are the results. By the way, you may have noticed reactions such as a thumbs up or heart coming across the screen. If you find this feature distracting, you can turn it off by clicking the four arrows in the top right hand corner of the slides widget, which will expand the slides area to full screen and no longer show the reaction. Also, before we move on, you will find our framework for a successful third-party risk management program ebook in the related content widget. 
In this ebook, you'll learn the foundational components of a third party risk management framework, which will help you develop your own program. Okay, Hillary, back to you. Okay, this next one is of particular interest in that how many full time dedicated third party risk management employees do we have? So cumulatively, 64% of organizations have less than five, with the majority of that number, 43%, having less than two. But it's really important to point out that third-party risk management teams, which are known for being very lean, might actually be getting leaner, especially in larger organizations. So although there's been a slight increase in the number of programs with six to 10 employees from 6% last year to 10% this year, that doesn't necessarily mean that third-party risk management teams are growing overall. Larger teams, those with more than 11 employees, could be undergoing staff reduction or right-sizing. So for example, only 5% of the organizations that responded this year said they had more than 20 FTEs compared to 8% in last year's survey. So back to the age-old question, how many people should we have on a third-party risk management team? I hate to say it, but with so many unique variables across organizations and industries, there just really isn't a simple answer. Although it is fair to say that third-party risk management programs have the right level of support, clear roles and responsibilities, and dedicated tools are going to be able to do more in less time and do it more efficiently. 13% of organizations out there don't have any dedicated third-party risk management employees. And that's a little troubling, especially when you consider all the potential problems that can arise from a lack of proper third-party risk management. Even if you're using a decentralized model or you're outsourcing your program, it's highly recommended that you have at least one dedicated employee who could take charge of your third-party risk management framework, policy, and program. Organizations use different methods and tools to manage third-party risk, and our survey showed that 54% of respondents were using specialized, dedicated third-party risk management software platforms or systems to do that. These platforms are really popular because they address all the complexities and interdependencies involved in third-party risk management. They also offer uh, communication and collaboration functions and can serve as an all-in-one document repository. Using third-party risk management modules in other systems like ERM or GRC tools has increased from 18% last year to 23% this year. And while these solutions can be good for replacing manual processes, it's important to understand that all ERM and GRC tools aren't always created equally, and a lot of them aren't always equipped to handle the intricate workflows and processes associated with third-party risk management. As a result, the TPRM team might find they are still you know, using manual processes for some of their work or having to create other workarounds. About 23% of organizations are using manual processes and generic tools like Excel, SharePoint, and Access. Now, this is a significant increase over last year's 12%, but it's important to remember that in the beginning, organizations with less mature third-party risk management programs tend to adopt simpler practices and use these basic tools because they're readily available and don't require any additional investment. So as programs become more established, they tend to adopt more advanced practices that require more sophisticated tools. Okay, now we can move into best practices. So to begin with, we asked about having a process in place to determine criticality. And it's great to see that 86% of organizations have this as an established practice. And this is the highest percentage we've ever reported in our annual survey. However, there were still 11% of respondents lack a process for identifying their critical vendors, and another 3% were unsure. And although these percentages are fairly low, it is essential for organizations to understand the significance of this process as an essential part of managing their third-party risk and complying with many regulations. Now, if you haven't defined your criteria for critical or you just want to check in on that, here's some 
easy ways that we suggest to identify your critical vendors. We start with three simple questions. Would the sudden loss of this vendor cause a significant disruption to your organization? Would that disruption affect your customers? And if it took more than 24 hours to restore service, would it cause material negative impact on your organization? If you answer yes to any of those questions, you're probably dealing with a critical vendor. Now, depending on your organization, you might add some additional criteria and consider things like the investment necessary to begin and manage the risk of that relationship or the operational impacts if you need to find and replace that vendor. We also want to think about revenue or expenses if that particular vendor has a failure, an unplanned outage, is that going to cause some financial effects? And then the last one, of course, which is becoming more and more relevant every day, is any time a third party accesses, transmits, processes, or performs transactions involving sensitive customer information or PII. Another fundamental best practice is that of inherent risk assessments. And we're happy to report that an overwhelming majority, 84% of our respondents adhere to this principle, which is also the highest ever reported in our survey. This is amazing, but we still have 16% of organizations that did not have or were a little unsure about their inherent risk assessment practices. So if your organization does not practice inherent risk assessments, this is going to result in significant issues within your third-party risk management process, primarily because you need to identify risk before you can manage them effectively. And inherent risk assessments also tell us about the specific types and amounts of risk we're trying to manage, which not only informs the scope, the depth of due diligence we need to conduct, but also helps us determine the types and frequency of ongoing monitoring required. Moreover, if you are within a regulated industry, the absence of inherent risk assessments will be cited as a material program issue by an examiner or an auditor. Residual risk refers to that level of risk that is remaining after we've considered the vendor's risk management practices and controls. Now, according to our survey, 66% of folks that responded do have an established formal process to evaluate residual risk. Cumulatively, another 34% don't have one or are unsure. Now, whether you're new to the concept of residual risk or you're well acquainted for it, it is crucial to understand that residual risk rating or score should never be used as a substitute or an override for the inherent risk rating. And that's because residual risk ratings are only used to indicate the level of confidence we have in a vendor's control, while inherent risk ratings are meant to establish the requirements for managing the vendor. By now, most of us know that we need to keep an eye on our third-party relationships as risk can emerge and change over time. So we wanted to know how often organizations were reassessing vendor risk as well as updating and reviewing due diligence documentation. So the frequency of those risk reassessments and reviews should always match the risk and criticality of the vendor engagement. And 52% of respondents aligned their frequency of reassessment with the risk presented by the engagement. The survey also found that 28% of the respondents reviewed their vendors every year, which is the minimum requirement for critical and high-risk vendors. However, other respondents reported different frequencies, but without any further context, it's hard to understand how they chose those intervals or if they are risk-based. Of those surveyed, 7% only perform a risk assessment before renewing a contract, while 3% don't perform any risk assessments at all. And speaking of updates, it is a best practice and regulatory expectation that you have a current and updated third-party risk management policy. Uh, best practice is to review the policy and update it as necessary at least once a year, and this is followed by at least 67% of survey respondents. 23% are doing their updates every one to two years, and another 5% are doing three years or more. 
a small percentage don't even have a policy. Again, it's strongly recommended for you to review and update your policies at least once a year. However, there might be other circumstances such as material new risk considerations, internal organizational changes, or regulatory updates that might make it necessary to perform more frequent or off-cycle reviews and updates. So as third-party risks are always changing and evolving, our tools to detect those risks need to change and evolve also. The recommended interval for reviewing and updating your inherent risk assessment is at least once a year, and 58% of survey participants were doing exactly that. Another 25% were doing it within one to two years. However, 10% were reviewing them every three years or longer, and 7% didn't have any inherent risk assessments at all. So it's really important to understand that the foundation for successful risk management is effective risk identification. An outdated inherent risk assessment might be compared to a smoke alarm with dead batteries. It's just not the best risk detection tool. So updating once a year is the best practice. Just like inherent risk assessments, we need to keep our vendor risk questionnaires and list of due diligence requirements current. And when we asked how often people were updating this information, 62% had updated it within the last year, which is the recommended interval, and another 24% had updated within one to two years. Now, of course, there's folks that are taking longer, not doing it at all, but again, our risk detection tools have to detect the most current risk. As a side note here, it's really important to make sure that you have your subject matter experts participate in the review and update process as they can add additional context or considerations that may not be obvious to the rest of the team. We also asked how organizations were reviewing fourth party vendors or subcontractors. Now, of course, your fourth parties are the vendors of your vendors the ones that you don't have a direct relationship or contract with. So any kind of effective review, obtaining information, or monitoring them can be really difficult. But 59% of organizations are following that best practice of reviewing the third-party risk management practices of their direct vendors. When you know your vendor has a good program in place and can prove that they follow the life cycle and that they're doing due diligence and have good monitoring, it makes your life that much easier. Another 18% of organizations are also using risk intelligence tools to monitor fourth party risk. This can be a very valuable and effective way to keep your eye on those relationships. You don't need a contract to monitor them, and it will give you real-time information about that fourth party's financial status, legal issues, security breaches, et cetera. Well, if it's seen that organizations have made significant progress in implementing their third-party risk management programs, the survey numbers demonstrate that the majority of organizations uh, are taking measures to establish and fully integrate third-party risk management processes into their business. 33% of survey respondents have reported fully established programs, while 38% are committed to improving their existing programs. The survey also found that only 17% are still in the initial stages of establishing those programs and implementing the process. So this is really great news, and it clearly indicates that third-party risk management is becoming fully integrated in today's business risk management environment. So many organizations have a keen interest in measuring the health and success of their third-party risk management program, and third-party risk management program metrics have become an area of increasing focus. As a matter of fact, 84% of our survey participants acknowledge the importance of these metrics and are at different stages of their development and implementation. Only 16% had no metrics or were unsure. But it's important to realize that the comprehensive evaluation and measurement of the program's health, stability, and effectiveness is really considered a best approach because it can help you identify those areas that require improvement, and program metrics can also predict potential risks and vulnerabilities due to things like inadequate resources, ineffective processes, 
or low internal compliance. Audits and regulatory exams are a regular and expected part of third-party risk management. And as such, it's really important for organizations to anticipate and prepare for them. Now, according to our survey, only 10% did not have an audit or regulatory exam in the past year. And for everyone else, 28% received feedback that improvements were needed. Another 17% didn't receive any specific comments. Now, a considerable number of participants had gone through their audit or exam with no findings. So this is really great, but we shouldn't chalk this up to simple good luck because it's more likely the result of hard work, commitment to continuous improvement, good organization, and a lot of preparation. So as a best practice to promote that continuous improvement, third-party risk management programs should really self-audit to identify gaps or areas of improvement. When performing a self-audit, you need to consider everything, but I do want you to pay attention to a few specific areas. The first one is, of course, your policy. Is it up to date? Does it comply with the regulations and laws that are specific to your organization? We want to think about those processes to make sure that they are in alignment with the policy. So if we have a requirement in the policy that's not being followed, that can be a problem. We want to also look at and consider any evidence we could provide to an auditor or examiner that would demonstrate that our processes are being followed as they're expected and that they're being executed consistently. We also, when it comes to those processes, want to think about how effective they are, how good are our tools and processes at helping us identify, assess, manage, and monitor risk. And then finally, is there clear accountability and oversight, not just at the top of the house, but for those individual activities and tasks? All right, while you're thinking about your self-audits, it is time for our next poll. Jesse? Our second poll question of the day is, in 2023, did your organization change the level of resources supporting your third-party risk management program? Yes, we had more resources. Yes, we had fewer resources, no changes, other, or not sure. Hillary, I have another question here that we could go ahead and answer. Great. Is it okay to have more risk ratings than moderate, low, moderate, or high? We have ratings like moderate, high, and severe. Okay, this is a really great question. It's one we hear a lot, and I'm going to break my answer down into two parts. The first part is your organization can have as many or as few risk ratings as it needs to accurately identify and manage those third-party risks. Now, one thing I want you to be extra uh, aware of and really consider is, is there value in having more risk ratings? For example, is the difference between a moderate high and a high risk so different that it's going to change your scope of third-party due diligence or how you monitor and manage that vendor? If it is, then you can have a real clear articulation of what those differences are and how that impacts your practices, then yes, by all means, have more. What we've generally found is that for most organizations, there's not a lot of difference. And so adding those extra layers can sometimes result in having, you know, a vendor uh, categorized not really at the right risk level or important steps or risk management activities are missed. The next part of this answer is as long as you are not using critical for a risk rating, uh, that is very important because that term critical is really meant to just identify that subset of vendors that are essential to your operations. And so what we've also found is that most critical vendors are also the highest risk vendors. So most critical vendors are high risk, not all high risk vendors are critical. I hope that information helps. Okay, here are those results. Thanks again, everyone, for taking the time to answer the poll. I would like to quickly direct your attention back to the related content widget where you will find our How to Get Organizational Buy-in and Commitment for Third-Party Risk Management eBook. 
This resource walks you through different tips for when you are seeking organizational buy-in. Be sure to check it out. Okay, Hillary, let's continue with the presentation. When asked if they were feeling pressure to improve their third-party risk management program, and if they were, what was the most significant source, 68% of people responded that they were feeling such pressure, and unsurprisingly, 34% of them said that that pressure was coming from auditors and regulators. Now, one thing that's interesting to note here is that almost a third of organizations weren't feeling any pressure at all. Now, this might be because as programs become more mature, more organizations are adopting proactive continuous improvement practices to kind of stay ahead of that internal and external scrutiny. But on the other hand, in some organizations, third-party risk management may not receive the attention it requires from management teams and boards. And without that proper oversight, these programs may stagnate and lack the motivation to improve. All right, let's talk about both new and emerging risks. We asked folks to rank these seven, and not a surprise at all, cybersecurity is still the number one concern. It has been for years now, and it was the top concern for 70% of our participants. But vendor AI is coming in hot on its heels in the number two spot. We also have those pending or anticipated regulatory changes coming in at number three, which feels right considering all the movement we had in that space last year. But interestingly, the availability of a vendor in an unexpected event, business continuity, is coming in fourth this year, and this has traditionally been in the number two spot. But even though it's come down the list, we still need to prioritize vendor business continuity. Now, vendor financial health is coming in fifth. This is also Coming up the list, because last year we had the failure of three regional banks, a lot of high interest rates, tightening credit, record-breaking inflation, and massive layoffs, which all reminds us about the importance of monitoring our vendors' financial health. ESG came in at six, and identifying and reporting the diverse status of vendors was seventh. And speaking of that number one risk, cybersecurity, we were curious how many folks had had a cybersecurity incident in the last 12 months. Well, 43% of respondents didn't report any, which is great. But more than half of the respondents did report incidents with varying degrees of impact. So let's look at what those impacts were. So amazingly, 41% of the organizations reported no impact. And it is unlikely that they were just lucky, because what this suggests is that there's well-designed processes, good planning, and strong internal controls that can reduce or eliminate the potential impact of a third-party cyber incident. But for those organizations that were affected, the incident resulted in monetary costs 29% of the time, reputational damage 26% of the time, and regulatory scrutiny was reported by 19% of the respondents. All right, as AI came in as the second most concerning emerging risk, we wanted to ask the organizations how they are currently or planning to assess and monitor vendor usage of artificial intelligence. Well, over half the organization survey did not monitor or were unsure of their vendors' AI usage. And this is probably because incorporating AI into third-party risk management programs is still relatively new. Still, 15% are using questionnaires and 8% are collecting documentation. Another 11% are thinking about those contracts. You know, a lot of organizations are finding this challenging because there is a lack of internal expertise on AI. So if you don't have a subject matter expert that can really help articulate the risk and help identify necessary controls, then I would seriously recommend seeking help from external professionals and credentialed subject matter experts to assist you in adding AI to your inherent risk assessments and your vendor due diligence questionnaires, as well as defining the types of due diligence documentation to request from your vendors regarding AI. And of course, 
AI is somewhat complex and a fluid landscape. There's a lot of emerging regulations. So it's really important that organizations have the right information and expertise to address it and keep their eyes open to what is going on. Now, we talked about risk, but let's talk about challenges. We had a list of 20 potential challenges. And the top three that came out are very similar to those in previous years. The number one challenge is getting the right documents from vendors, that's 48% followed by having enough internal resources, 36, which closely ties to the time management concern reported by 27% of the respondents. All right, let's talk about ROI for a moment. We know that there's several factors that are gonna influence an organization's decision to invest in third-party risk management. Generally speaking, organizations that receive a benefit and a return on investment are going to be more committed to the practice. Our survey showed that nearly all respondents, 96%, stated that their organization acknowledges the ROI associated with third-party risk management, even though 40% of them said there may be differing opinions of their organization. So for those organizations that still have questions about ROI, one of the biggest challenges is that we're still calculating ROI on cost savings or revenue versus a cost avoid formula. And when you think about third party risk management, it really is about cost avoids or preventing things from happening that are going to impact our organization in a financial sense, whether that's an interruption to our business operations or avoiding regulatory fines or lawsuits or even preventing lost revenue because we lost the trust of our customers through something like a data breach. But you know, there are plenty of real world examples that illustrate the cost of not having third party risk management. So let's take a look at those real quick. So obviously cybersecurity is top of mind. So what can just one data breach cost you? Well, according to the most recent IBM Poneman Institute report, the average cost of a data breach in the US is now 4.45 million or about 165 dollars per record. So if you have a single breach that compromises 15,000 records, that's going to cost you almost two and a half million dollars. And that's just the cost to remediate the breach. It doesn't talk about the potential loss of customers or damage to your reputation. So if you have 10 vendors with access to customer records, that risk grows exponentially. So in a lot of cases, it doesn't take very much just one breach to justify that cost of third-party risk management. In another brief example, third-party risk management helps us cost avoid those dollars associated with regulatory fines. In 2023, a major financial institution was fined $15 million, one of the highest fines ever on record, specifically for not having sufficient third-party risk management practices. And that is only what they paid in the regulatory fine. We do not know how much they lost in customer trust and revenue. So beyond ROI, let's look at what the survey told us when we asked folks to rank seven following reasons from one to seven as to why their organization does third-party risk management. Unsurprisingly, meeting regulatory requirements was the number one reason again, followed closely by avoiding third-party cyber incidents. That is, want to protect their brand and reputation were high on the list, as was aligning with industry best practices and standards. A little more surprisingly, that managing vendor performance and controlling costs came in lower. But the answers here were pretty consistent with what we've seen in previous surveys. But I want to take a moment to just look at what some of our participants said in their own words about the value of third-party risk management and why they practice it at their organization. As I mentioned at the start of the presentation, we have a really wide variety of people who participate in our annual survey. And when we ask them why their organization has third-party risk management, we've got a variety of answers. Well, I can't read them all to you, and there's certainly so many more in our white paper. Let me just call out a few of the highlights. One said that it contributed to effective business continuity strategies. 
Another mentioned that it reduces that risk of third-party incidents. Discovery of non-conformance and non-compliance to protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data, and raising awareness to the business. Additionally, proactively identifying and taking steps to mitigate potential risks either before or after onboarding was also listed. So while you are contemplating these reasons and thinking about your own, let's go to our last poll of the day. Just our third and final poll question is, our top third-party risk management program goal for 2024 is catching up on backlogged work, process improvement, stakeholder training and awareness, one or more of the above, other, we're not sure. Hillary, let's answer another question from the audience. I'm ready. Is a vendor risk review the same as a control assessment? Ah, that's a great question. And yes, essentially, they are the same. But there's a little bit of nuance here. So a vendor risk review is considering all of the vendor's risk practices as well as the sufficiency of the individual controls they have to address those risks that were identified. In a more uh, direct sense, a control assessment is going to go talk specifically about the controls related to that particular risk domain. So you might have a control assessment for cybersecurity or business continuity. But essentially, in the broadest terms, they are the same and they are capturing the same information. I hope that's helpful. Thanks, Hillary. We have about 40 seconds left on our open poll question, so please be sure to submit those answers. If you have any issues submitting the poll, please feel free to send us a message via the Ask Question widget, and we will be happy to assist. We will be closing in just about 15 seconds, so please go ahead and answer this poll question. Thank you. And here are those results. Thanks again, everyone, for answering this poll question. In the related content widget, you'll find our vendor cybersecurity checklist. A cybersecurity is a top risk that many are concerned about. This is a great checklist to have on hand. It discusses the cybersecurity questions to ask your vendors. Hillary, let's continue with the presentation. As we come to the end of our time today, let's wrap up with some best practices for 2024. First, we want to make sure that we have enough resources and skilled staff to support our third-party risk management team at the organization. And we want to make sure that we have really solid governance documents, including your policy, program, and procedures. Keep your risk assessment tools sharp. That means looking at your inherent risk assessments, vendor risk questionnaires, and due diligence documents. Update them and keep them relevant to the current risk environment. And if you have yet developed and implemented some third-party risk management program metrics, this is a great year to do that not only going to help you articulate the success and effectiveness of the program, but it also might help you identify any gaps or weaknesses that might actually be a risk to the organization. Keep your vendor issues logged, tracked, and managed through remediation. And keep in mind that educated stakeholders and vendor owners are just naturally more compliant and help the process run smoother. So if you're struggling getting that right level of support, Think about some focused education and training so they can effectively fulfill their third-party risk management responsibilities. If you're struggling with time, really start thinking about other tools and strategies that can help you work more effectively, like maybe moving away from manual processes or outsourcing a portion of your due diligence document collection. Make sure to keep senior management and the board well informed. Not only is this a regulatory requirement, but that visibility can help your program elevate and get more authority. Stay on top of your industry news and enforcement actions. You can utilize risk intelligence, internet news alerts, but we need to keep our eye on what's going on. And then last but not least, keep a mindset of continuous improvement. 
All right, everyone, thank you for your time today. I'm going to pass it back over to Jesse for some more information and Q&A. Great. Thank you so much, Hillary. Before we dive into more questions and answers, I would like to thank everyone for attending. I would also like to thank Hillary for her time in sharing some important information. On your screen now, you will see our upcoming webinars. On February 15th, our Identifying the Key Players for Third-Party Risk Management at Your Credit Union webinar. And on February 20th, our How to Continuously Monitor Vendors webinar. We hope you will be able to join us for those sessions. A link to register for those is in your copy of today's presentation slides. Let's now go ahead and answer some more questions that have come in during the session. Okay, Hillary, our next question is, how do you overcome lack of engagement from your business owners when performing third-party risk management? Uh, it is a common issue for a lot of organizations. And while there's a lot of ways to go about it, the top three things I can recommend is, first of all, invest some time and energy into creating some good education and training for those folks. When people understand the purpose of third-party risk management and how to perform those activities correctly, they're just naturally much more likely to participate and support the program. The other thing is to really think about the tone from the top in your organization. If your board and your senior management are not talking about third-party risk management, they're not communicating its importance to the organization, that can be a major contributor. So look into that. And if you're seeing issues, talk to your management and maybe your risk committee about it. And then the last one, of course, is to try and hold these folks accountable whenever possible. If that means developing a KPI with HR that can be added to their performance reviews, that's great. And that actually motivates a lot of uh, people to be more present with their party risk management and fulfill their responsibilities. So I hope that's helpful. Great. Our next question. What considerations should be made when determining the optimal operating model for third-party risk management? Right. Well, there's not just one consideration. There's actually quite a few. So it's, first of all, you know, just every organization is different. Those so structural alignments can really contribute to what is going to be effective or not. It's also important to think about how much work is actually being done by, say, third-party risk management team versus the vendor owners. Um, you know, in very large organizations, sometimes they just do go to a centralized model because it's more efficient uh, for some organizations and they get things more done quicker. Um, but what I would say your consideration should be, who are the people tasked with doing the responsibilities? Are they qualified enough? And do they have the right resources to manage those activities effectively? Um, sometimes when they don't, that centralized version can work. But a lot of times that hybrid version is really the optimal version because it's spreading that accountability and responsibility for third-party risk management across the business. So we want as much internal awareness and participation as we can get for maximum effectiveness. I hope that helps. Great. Our next question. Could you please clarify by what is meant by centralized third-party risk management? Our organization practices centralized vendor management, but decentralized vendor ownership, and I was unsure of which category we fit in. Um, it sounds like you actually would be in a hybrid environment because you have that centralized team, which I can assume is responsible for the framework and just monitoring those processes while the vendor ownership is distributed out throughout the business units and other stakeholders. That is really the definition of a hybrid model right there. Um, I hope that answers your question. I think we have time for a few more here. How should we assess the risk or criticality of fourth parties? Should it be any different than how we assess their relative third parties? Well, you've got to keep in mind that uh, 
to really assess risk, you have to have all the information. And we do that through an inherent risk assessment. But I would, I would caution folks before they go out and start doing inherent risk assessments on all their fourth parties to really go back and review the third party risk management practices of their direct vendors. It's those direct vendors that should be assessing that risk, should be monitoring those vendors, you know, updating due diligence, et cetera. You've got to know that your direct vendors have strong processes in place because it's too easy to miss something with the fourth party. So I would, in best practice, depend on your direct vendors to not only tell you who's critical, but also the risk. Uh, the risk ratings and types of risks that are present with their fourth parties, and I would expect them to manage them. They also should be able to provide evidence of doing so. I hope that answers the question. Great. And our next question. If a vendor is critical, why not just make that your highest risk rating versus adding a second risk rating with it, as it would unlikely change the due diligence needed? You're absolutely correct that it's probably not going to change the due diligence. As a matter of fact, I recommend that the due diligence for a high risk and a critical are virtually identical. The reason you want to have critical as its own identifier is because it's not meant to be a risk rating. It is meant to be a way to identify that small subset of vendors that are essential to your operations, right? So you might have a lot of high risk vendors. But your doors aren't necessarily going to close if they turn off for 24 hours. So just, again, criticality and the label of critical should only be used to identify those vendors that are actually essential to your operation. And again, a lot of those vendors are already going to be high risk. So I hope that answers the question. If not, let us know and we'll get you more information. Great. Our next question. Does our list of vendors have to include their risk rating, or is it the name and product enough? As a best practice, it absolutely should include their risk rating. It should also denote if they're critical. Uh, you want to be able to sort that list on a lot of different attributes. You might be able to want to look at maybe all your data providers, or you know, what are the types of products and services you consider moderate. So yes, more information is better, and at a minimum, name, uh, vendor owner name, product or service, a, their risk rating, and if they're critical or not. Hope that answers the question. Thanks, Hillary. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have left for questions today. Thanks again, Hillary, for taking the time to address some of those that came in. Any questions we did not have time to answer today, we will address offline. We would like to thank you all for attending and hope you found today's session valuable. A big thank you to Hillary for her time and content. You can ask even more questions inside of our third-party think tank, an online community that is dedicated to third-party risk professionals and free to join. Just because today's session has ended doesn't mean the conversations and questions must. Post your questions at thirdpartythinktank.com and see what your peers have to say. In the community, you'll find thousands of free educational resources related to third-party risk management topics to assist you. If you would like to become a member of Third Party Think Tank, you can register on the site or shoot us an email and we will get you registered and send you a link to set your password. We did record today's session and that recording link will be provided to you in a follow-up email that you will receive tomorrow afternoon. Also in that follow-up email will be the survey link for you to request the CPE credit. On behalf of Inminder, it has been a pleasure. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.